According to the NCIC, as of 2022, the number of reported missing, unknown, unsolved cases had a major influx since 2020. Currently, the total is 521,705 cases. Out of those 521,705 cases, our black race makes up 177,530 of those total cases. That means that 34% more of all the cases come from our black community. Yet and still, a number of these cases have gone unsolved, unheard, unpublicized, or even been thrown to the side due to being wrongfully filed as solved or closed. When in fact, some of these cases should still be open today so that they could receive the proper investigation and their due justice. Over here, we will not forget, nor will we ignore those who have fallen victim to these unfortunate crimes as the public media and public news, along with the law enforcement, have forgotten. So join me as I tell their stories in an effort to keep their names alive and to give a voice to those who no longer have a voice. You are now tuned in on the case with Sai J. This is Given a Voice. girls and women reported missing in the U.S. in 2020 were black. That is according to the National Crime Information Center. And yet those cases often get little attention or are all but ignored by law enforcement and national news media. Over many decades, there's been a list of unsolved cases that have grown cold or just left us with many questions, <laughs> more questions than answers. Let's talk about some of the cases, some of the people who are missing. In 2020 to 2021, a Washington DC man was reported missing but he went to Gray Bull, Wyoming. So he went missing from Gray Bull, Wyoming. The man's name was Devante Richardson. He was reported and last seen July 22nd of 2020. It was said that he went missing after leaving DC to drive to Gray Bull, Wyoming in hopes to meet his buddy, Ye, to accomplish his long lived dream of becoming a big time rap artist. It is believed that the buddy Ye he spoke of was that of Kanye West. Police located his car and his belongings, including his cell phone, his laptop, which stored all his music and his beats. They did not find Devante. They questioned Kanye's security team, which they claim he never made it and he was never seen. However, Police located his vehicle, but they have yet to still locate Devante. As of October 28, 2021, he was reported as still missing.
So in 2019, Charlton or Carlton, Carlton County, Georgia. I don't know. I don't know, y'all. I think it's Carlton County, Georgia. Charlton? Carlton? Then in 2019, we got a case. Then in 2019, there was a case in, I don't know if it's Charleston, y'all, or if it's Charleston, or Carlton. I don't know. But y'all know from Georgia. Carlton County, Georgia. That's where this case was from. Anyway, let's go on. So in 2019, Charleston, Carlton County, Georgia. March 31st, 2019, Shataya Elaine Heron was attending an event. While leaving the event, she was shot and wounded in the parking lot. Twenty eighteen, Chicago, Illinois, October second, two thousand and eighteen, Kiera Coles was a pregnant postal worker, pregnant with her first child. And according to her family, she was very excited and looking forward to meeting her new bundle of joy. However, nobody knows if she got that chance because she vanished and was reported missing and still missing as of October 2nd, 2021. twenty seventeen Waterloo, Iowa. June third, two thousand and seventeen. Michaela Jordan Bond Hill was shot through her window, her bedroom window. And yet and still there's no resolve for her case. Two thousand and thirteen. Des Moines, Iowa. Christmas Eve, December 24th, 2013. Janita Clements was shot and killed while in her home. She was believed to not be the intended target. However, she became the target. She is survived by a daughter, son, and grandchildren. As of December 21st, 2021, there has still been no arrest in her case. 2011, Norwalk, Connecticut. Erokis Austin and Rakita Smalls, the couple was reported to have been in the car with gunshot wounds. A witness reportedly called in to report the incident while observing the scene through a window of his home with binoculars. He reported the woman in the driver's seat was shot and slumped over. While unsure of the man's fate in the passenger seat, he reported what he thought to be the passenger window shot out, which turned out to be in fact correct. Both have yet to have their case solved. 2009, South Los Angeles. A woman by the name of Maitrice Richardson ate at a restaurant and was reported to the law enforcement by a hostess who was serving her. The hostess claimed Maitrice was observed getting up from her table and was assumed to be skipping out on the bill. Maitrice was taken into custody and supposedly later released around 1230 a.m. from the station. When she was released from the station, her mother reported that she was released with nothing but the clothes on her back. She had no money, she had no purse, she had no cell phone, and she definitely didn't have her Her phone. mother called the police station to see if they were going to release her that evening or if they were going to hold her. 
she said if they were going to hold her, she was just going to hold off and, you know, come and get her the next day. But that didn't end up happening. The police ended up releasing her. And her mother kind of wanted them to hold her because she was showing signs of confusion as if she didn't understand what was going on. She was kind of all over the place. And so her mother really wanted them to hold her. But that didn't happen. So being that they released her and with no way home, my trees reportedly had walked off trying to find her way back home, looking for a ride or whatever. She had left the station on her own. But Lisa, said when my trees left the station, she was completely confused. They looked through her car. They looked through everything that she had when they picked her up from the restaurant and they noticed she had medication, a whole bunch of bottles of medication. She had a lot of alcohol, um, marijuana. So they figured she was all confused because of everything that she had probably uh, consumed. But when they released her, she was still in a confused state of mind. She was just mentally all over the place, but they still went against the grain and they still re released her. They didn't hold her, they didn't wait, they released her. And then Mytrice went missing. 11 months later, Mytrice was found in Dark Canyon, about 6.5 miles from the police station. To this day, her mother is still fighting for justice in the name of her daughter. And then a case from 2007, which will actually be our first case that we discuss on this channel. This case comes from 2007 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, October 19th, 2007. May 20th, 1986. The date, Maria Brown, a French Canadian Mexican mother, and William Brown, an African American father, parents of four who gave birth to their fifth child, who was highly recognized for taking tour with Life Jennings and performing their duet for their leading single, S.E.X., in the 2005-2006 era. A beautiful baby girl by the name of Yolanda Rose Brown, or better remembered today as Yolanda Rose Lala Brown once an inspiring artist. From the time Lala Brown was walking, her mother and father could remember her bouncing all around the house, singing and dancing. As Lala grew up and got a little older, around the age of nine, she started to discover her own abilities and skills. About nine. So you say you need a friend, you need someone that you can share your dreams with. Yeah, okay, same. Well, that's why the minimum. Dancing, singing, and writing her own lyrics. At an early age, Lala knew exactly what she wanted to do with her life and just who she wanted to be in her life. And so she did just that. She continued to enhance her skills as a performer and prepare for the future, pushing to accomplish her big dreams of becoming a big time entertainer. Her family believed in her and supported her fully, especially her father, William Brown. He was working at a steel plant at the time and decided to retire from the plant just so he could manage Lala to the best of his ability to get her where she needed to be. Lala's father enrolled her into voice lessons, shopping her around for different scouting agencies and talent agencies. She got a lot of practice from these activities, including performing in talent shows at the school and singing wherever she could. By the time Lala was 11 years old, she was singing professionally and hitting all the local events. She went by the stage name Premier. Lala was singing at weddings, 
She was singing jingles for the local radio stations, and she later started to perform at the local bars. Lala attended Frederick Douglass Elementary School, Jackie Robinson Middle School, and she attended Milwaukee High School of Arts. While still attending high school, Lala became pregnant at the age of 16. She gave birth to a beautiful baby girl by the name of Amira Ariel Brown. This didn't deter Lala from her long-lived dreams of becoming an entertainer though. Giving birth to another life gave Lala more drive and major push to finally reach further. Lala became more motivated and focused traveling to and from New York and Atlanta just to do auditions. Fall of 2005, where Lala's life meets her dreams. Three years older, three years later, at the age of 19, with all Lala's hard work, dedication, and determination, she began to reach new heights. Lala was persistent which allowed doors to open, create new opportunities. Though not instantly, Lala had finally caught the eye and attention of a prominent figure in the industry. By fall of 2005, Lala Brown met Life Jennings, who soon became her protege. By this time, Lala was dealing with a friend of Life Jennings by the name of Corn. She was also working a nightclub in Atlanta that Life Jennings would frequent a lot with Corn. Corn would later play a major role in jumpstarting Lala's career, bridging the gap between her and Jennings for a collaborative feature. Lala had expressly told Corn that she just wanted a chance to sing for Jennings. She was really ambitious, just out seeking any opportunity to display her talented skills. Lala knew if given just one chance, she would rope Jennings in with her vocal skills. She knew that once he heard her voice, she would leave an impressionable mark on Life Jennings, leaving him no other option but to sign her. Per usual, Life Jennings and Corn hit the same club Lala was working at. And with Lala's dream in mind, Corn asked Jennings if his friend Lala could sing for him. Corn had asked Jennings a few times, but he would always decline the offer, being that they were in a strip club. And at the time, he just didn't want to hear any singing in the club atmosphere. He just felt the timing was wrong due to the scenery. Meanwhile, Life Jennings was collaborating with another female artist on the track SEX before it later became the well-known single La La Brown was featured on. Originally, this unknown artist was featured on the single. However, while trying to collaboratively work on creative parts of the song, there stood some issues in the way which changed the direction of the project. Life Jennings called the artist to work on parts of the song, but she told him her manager slash boyfriend did not want Jennings contacting her directly. She further explained to Life Jennings that if he wanted to continue collaborating with her, he would need to reach out to her through her management team. Life Jennings didn't find the new arrangement very convenient. At that point, Life had a decision to make as he was not in tune to work in that way. He wanted the creative space and the creative chemistry so he could freely work to create a harmonious piece of art as he envisioned for the song. Once he came to the realization that the collab wasn't working out seamlessly, 
he decided to be open to new feature opportunities. Meanwhile, Lala didn't stop stepping on Life Jennings' neck, even though he declined prior offers for her to sing for him. Lala didn't allow anything to get in her way. After asking Jennings on occasion of three times, his no then became a yes. While Jennings was attending the club again, Lala ran into him. But this time when she seen him, she made a witty comment, which caught his attention. Being a little caught off guard, Life Jennings decided to hear what Lala had to offer. He liked her voice, and just like that, Lala was on. Life extended the opportunity, telling her he was flying out to New York the next day and he needed someone on this record. Lala, of course, took this offer. So Life Jennings flew her out to New York the next day where the song was created. 2006, where Life Jennings invites Lala to tour with him. Life Jennings signed Lala to his label, Jesus Swings. The duo received nationwide exposure for the creative work. Lala was featured on his first single, S.E.X., which was directed by Benny Boone, and it came out on his second studio album called The Phoenix. This album was released on August 15th, 2006. It reached number two on the U.S. album charts and number one on the U.S. R&B charts. This song received a lot of airplay on the radio, and it was in heavy rotation all over the place by October of 2006 that year. I remember this song hitting 106 and Park heavy back then. I remember when the song debuted and I remember when the song was performed by both of them. The song was a big hit and it was different. It just created a different vibe and it presented a different message than we were all used to receiving back then from the artists in the music industry at that time. The song encouraged young women not to fall victim to peer pressure. And it encouraged young women to love themselves and hold on to their innocence, as quoted by Lala herself when she sung the line. time growing up in that era. The song served as a cautionary warning to young women about the pitfalls and dangers that could potentially come with unprotected sex. The song encouraged many young women to stay focused, be smart, think twice, and how to value their own self-worth. It hit a lot of people different when they heard it. I think that's why it received a lot of play and got good feedback. The song was well received and debuted on Billboard's Hot 100 R&B chart and Hot R&B Hip Hop Songs Top 5 Hits. The song spun repeatedly through the airways, BET, MTV, and other media platforms during that time. People were blown away by Lala's beautiful voice and her angelic appearance when she hit the scene. They took to the new up and coming artists almost instantly and becoming overnight fans of the duo. Fans became interested in what was to come next from the new superstar. The duo toured all over that year, performing their leading single. One notable mention they made an appearance at was the Green Dolphin Street nightclub or bar. I'm not sure if it was a nightclub or a bar, but 
it was one of the sorts. But yeah, they made an appearance there. Which is why it was no surprise when many questions and speculations came after Lala was no longer seen next to Jennings performing the song or traveling with them shortly after. It had became apparent something was different as Jennings continued to perform the song in company of a new partner in replace of Miss Lala Brown. It was as if she just disappeared off the scene. One day, just touring as a big superstar. And then the next, she just wasn't. It was always a little shady and unclear about why the two just weren't collaborating anymore. 2007. After months of disagreements and arguments, Lala is released from her contract and kicked off tour. Then June of 2007 came, when it became more apparent to the people in Milwaukee why Lala was no longer touring as she returned home. Still very unclear as to what exactly caused the split, little explanation was given that the duo had been having arguments and disagreements for months on end prior to the release of Lala's contract. She was removed from the remainder of the tour. Though Lala was disappointed and devastated, she still pursued her dreams relentlessly. Lala continued, creating a new lane for herself as a solo artist. She linked up with one of the hottest well-known producers of her home state, Jatan Kool-Aid Claiborne, born July 18th, 1985. It was told by his mother, Dina Chambers, that Jatan had a big white smile, AKA Kool-Aid, which is who he became known as later. To give up her dreams of fame and fortune, she teamed up with the hottest homegrown music producer in the Brew City, Jatan Kool-Aid Claiborne. They called him Kool-Aid because of his big, wide smile. He was across the board talented from anything house, club music, R&B, hip hop, gospel, you name it. Jatan was also very determined to make his mark in the music business, just as Lala was. He was described as a go-getter and talented, who was musically inclined at an early age. It was said that Kool-Aid could produce any style of music, such as R&B, club, pop, jazz, gospel, and so much more. At about the age of 16 years old, Kool-Aid started to save up money and scrounge wherever he could to be able to save up enough to open up his very first studio, later known as Loud Enough Productions. By the time Kool-Aid hit 21 or 22, he had saved up enough to get his studio up and running. The studio was located on a busy block at 5514 55th in Lisbon. Loud Enough Productions became Kool-Aid's sanctuary and home. Sadly, months to follow, it would be the total opposite. Kool-Aid was preparing to work with Jay-Z around the time that he linked up with Lala to create new work for her independent album. The two worked on three tracks at this time. One was called I'm feeling it. Another was called Rescue Me. And the third one was called Give Them What They Want about Lala's life. Yeah. <laughs>
naturally, the pair grew closer together as they had a common interest in music and worked together. They eventually began a relationship together as the two worked nonstop around the clock in each other's presence. Once they began seeing each other, Lala moved into the studio with her new love. The two would stay up all night and day working on new tracks as Lala hit the pavement to promote herself performing at clubs and bars. After finally getting past the short-lived success with Life Jennings, Lala was just getting back to her old routine. She was getting back on track and feeling just as motivated and confident as she was before. She was getting herself ready to head out to New York to meet with music agents. However, just as Lala was getting herself back on the right foot, her life took yet another devastating turn. Lala was beginning to face a lot of hate and envy from people around the way. It is often said that you get the most hate or fake love from the people you know from your own hometown, which is why a lot of prominent figures and a lot of celebrities, once they make it out, they don't return. This became an issue that weighed heavy on Lala as it escalated. Starting from jealousy, to receiving threatening phone calls, to people calling and hanging up. Lala made a report of the incident and then filed a restraining order. Once Lala began to fear for her life, she started to look for a new apartment far away from the studio the two had shared. She asked a few people around the way that she knew if anyone knew of any apartments that were available right away. ...what's going on in their lives. So I stopped by the salon on a hunch and I learned a lot. Um, Kool-Aid, he was usually his little upbeat self, but Lala, she was, you could tell something wrong with her. She was like, uh, she was getting like phone calls, threatening phone calls and people hanging up and stuff like that. And where her life? Threatening her life. But she didn't say who? She didn't say who. Yeah. Or if it was a male or female, she never said. And she was actually asking if anybody knew any, you know, apartment listing because she wanted to move from the studio where they were living in. She wanted to move right away because she felt threatened for her life. But she said that three days before she died. Including a mutual friend of theirs that they had supposedly seen the Saturday before, which was October the 13th. But we'll get back to that in a minute. After the report and restraining order was in full effect, the studio was broken into. The studio had been robbed of $10,000 worth of equipment. Cooley had then went and made a report of his own following the incident. October 15, 2007. Lala intensely grew worried and became more concerned with finding a new place to live. The evening following the robbery, the couple visited Lala's parents' home to have dinner with them. After dinner, the couple was dropped back home to the studio by Lala's parents, who were unaware about the unfortunate fate the two were about to face. The couple were reported missing. In the following days, the family members grew concerned as everyone was trying to reach them but were unable to do so. So Lala's parents stopped by the studio, considering Lala had not returned any of their calls. Upon reaching the studio, Lala's parents had noticed all the lights were on in the studio, but no one was answering the door. They called Lala's name, but still no response. When there was no response, the family left, thinking that they would soon hear from them. The family had tried to reach out to them again the following day, but was met with the same results. No answer. So Lala's father called Kule's brother to see if he had heard from them. But again, nobody did. The parents drove by the studio yet again, just to check on them. They also noticed that this time when they came back, once again, the lights were still on and nobody had answered. Nobody returned a call. 
nobody would open the door. They knocked at the door and got no answer. They tried to open the door, but it was locked. Three days had gone by, running into the fourth day that the couple had been last seen or heard from. Lala's parents became really anxious, knowing that this wasn't of Lala's normal behavior. She would never go missing or leave for too long, knowing that her five-year-old daughter was in the care of her parents as she worked in the studio. She was an active parent, and so her parents knew something was off. And so the parents decided to reach out to the owner of the studio, explaining the situation, and to see if he would let them in just to do a wellness check. But the owner told them he couldn't do so without having a missing person report. It would be considered an illegal entry without having any type of authority to do so. So he asked them to obtain a missing persons warrant first. So to get the ball rolling, the parents had it to file a missing persons report and awaited a warrant as the building owner asked them to do so. October 19th, 2007. The next day, while still waiting to gain access to the studio, Kool-Aid's brother grew impatient and decided to take matters into his own hands. He called Lala's dad and told him he was tired of waiting and he was going to go kick in the front door. With Lala's dad still on the other end of the phone, he kicked the door in. Kicked in the door. He took a deep sigh and put the phone down for a couple minutes. Went to the back room. And then he came back to the phone. I found him. They're both dead. The words that Kool-Aid's brother spoke with deep devastation. That's where they lay. That's where we found them. Shot to death. In an instant, two lives and their dreams had ended in a surreal nightmare of violence. I said no. No. <laughs> No one heard from the couple. So we drove down there, me and my wife, and knocked on the door, couldn't hear nothing, see nothing. By Friday, both families started to worry. Jatan's brother called Mr. Brown. He said, I'm going in. I just heard something say, bloom. And then he just, it was a deep sigh. Then he came back to the phone. He said, I just found they both dead. Total shock. <laughs> William Brown still struggles when talking about the loss of his daughter. He was immediately hit with foul odor of decaying flesh as soon as he entered the studio. Kool-Aid's brother had discovered the couple in a terrible state. He had found his brother linked back into a chair as a result of a gunshot wound to the left eye. And he had a bullet wound straight through his hand. It is assumed that he obtained this hand wound by trying to defend himself while shielding his left eye. As for Lala, she was found in an adjacent room. Considering Lala was a little woman, we could assume she would have been physically weaker than Kool-Aid. However, she seemed to receive the brunt of the attack. She was found face down riddled with bullets and assumed to be trying to escape her attacker at the time of the murder, but was blocked off exit due to a wall. She sustained notable wounds in her back, among others, as a result of running away from the attacker. She sustained a gunshot wound to her neck, her right shoulder, her left lower back, straight through her right forearm, and she was grazed on the right side of her chest, and grazed on the right upper arm. A ballistics report and autopsy had been performed and it determined that the couple was not shot close range, but from a distance. The autopsy report, along with obvious sign of progressed decomposition, had determined the couple had already been dead at least three days before they were discovered. The cops had also noted that 
they were almost unrecognizable by the time they were discovered. I remember when I first heard about this case and all I could think of was the sympathy, the compassion I felt for the families, the parents, the kids, and the rest of the family. And it was even more sad because at the time, Lala had a five-year-old daughter. kool also had kids, two boys, one of which was not even born yet. kool was murdered before the birth of his second child, robbing them both of the chance to ever meet. He has two beautiful children, Jatan, Jeremiah Claiborne, Isaiah, Curtis Claiborne, who carries his name. Isaiah never even met his father. He was murdered and gunned down before his birth. And it's just sad that I have to explain their dad to him, you know, to them. Lala's father passed away without even getting an answer as to what happened to his daughter. Not only that, but Kool-Aid's aunt also passed away without getting answers about what happened to her nephew. Still, they don't know what happened in this case. As a mother and a daughter, I just can't even imagine having to deal with the pain of losing my babies or my parents. Imagine having to bear the weight of carrying a trauma like this throughout the rest of your life. Not being able to share those important moments throughout your life with your parent or them not being able to be present as you accomplish those major milestones in life, like graduations or college, watching all your peers and friends interacting with their parents, but yet yours isn't able to be there for you and not even by choice, but because of somebody else's will, their bad decision-making and because of their own stupidity. You gotta be a strong person with a strong backbone to be able to carry a trauma like that. And then to not even know what happened to your parent, who did this to your parent or why. I just couldn't imagine how hard that would be. But it's just even more traumatizing as a kid. So I just can't imagine what it would be like growing up without your parent like that. You know, she says she remembers her mom and she remembers things about her. But you know, at five, we got a vague memory, just like the last little moments that we really remember. But it's not like actually having your parent grow up with you throughout life. And I'm sure it's very traumatizing to her. And it's very hard. They were both senselessly taken from their loved ones. And hopefully they get answers really soon. The cops have scoured the crime scene, looking for any evidence as well as asked many people in the area if they had any information or if they had witnessed anything. Being in the studio, it had a lot of foot traffic. Despite having so much foot traffic, police still couldn't pin down any solid leads and nobody had claimed to witness anything. Even though nobody was speaking up, the police felt that they knew their assailants because they were comfortable enough to let them in as they continue to work on tracks. That uh, Lala and Kool-Aid actually knew the perpetrator. There were no signs of forced entry and evidence uh, recovered from the scene uh, revealed that the, uh, that the perpetrator uh, did not force his way into the building. High V100. Yeah, the V100 high. Investigators noted no known evidence of forced entry. They gathered up a few suspects of interest, but they later had to release them due to not having enough probable cause to hold them on charges or to move forward with a prosecution. They had recovered some surveillance footage from nearby businesses, but they said it was too fast and too quick to really make anything of it. The assailants were in and out, so the footage wasn't of much help. Nearby surveillance video shows the killer entering. And moments later, you see a person uh, running out of, out of the uh, studio. Police said the entire crime happened in less than two minutes. We 
Despite law enforcement's efforts, they had nothing substantial to lead to any answers. We actually don't know what the motive, you know, behind these murders were. But police do believe the couple knew the killer. One of them opened the door to the studio. After, the case went cold and drug on for years. The burials. Yolanda Rose Lala Brown, 21, was laid to rest six days later. October 25th, 2007. There was a lot of people in attendance to Lala's funeral to pay their final respects, including her one-time protege, Life Jennings. The funeral service took place at Milwaukee's Mason Temple Church of God in Christ. Burial proceeded at Graceland Cemetery in Milwaukee. Jatan Kule Claiborne, 22, was laid to rest two days later than Lala, October 27, 2007, at 11 a.m. The funeral was held at Mason Temple Kojic with Intermittent and Graceland Cemetery in Milwaukee, same as Lala. Featured grave visits. I came across both of the grave sites while searching online, as well as came across some fans or friends leaving comments of memories and posts of flowers they sent to their burial sites. I also came across some fans paying respect, taking them flowers or telling their story to others as they visited their burial sites. One of the people I ran across was Lamont at large, a YouTuber. I watched a lot of his videos while scrolling YouTube one day prior to coming across this video. He had an interesting thumbnail. So I decided to check out his page and ended up binge watching a lot of the stories I never heard of. The people he narrates about live some interesting lives. I probably wouldn't have known about a lot of them had I not come across their story through his channel. But when I was searching online, I came across his channel featuring a video of him visiting the studio and the burial site while narrating Lala and Kool-Aid's story. Lamont at large travels to different sites while storytelling about the previous lives and legacies the victims lived. Some sites are requested while others are ones he's just interested in visiting. You can watch the full video on his channel. His link will be listed in the description box below. Later features. By February 2010, there was still no big breaks in the case, but the couple's story was featured on America's Most Wanted. The show's investigator and producer, Tom Morris Jr., traveled to Lala and Kool-Aid City of Milwaukee with many questions in hand. His first stop was to Milwaukee's radio station, 100.7, blazing hip hop and R&B, and then to a mutual friend of the couple who had supposedly last seen them the Saturday before, which was October the 13th. Brown, the first time Reggie heard Lala Brown sing a note, he knew she was a star waiting to shine. Yeah, she was way ahead of herself. She was an incredible talent. Uh, I've got a question. Um, as far as um, Lala and um, Kool-Aid, um, do y'all have any like possible leads or, you know, as in a motive as to why to the tragic thing what happened? If anybody knew any, you know, apartment listing because she wanted to move from the studio where they were living in, she wanted to move right away because she felt threatened for her life. But she said that three days before she died. Now let's double back to that previous point I said we'll revisit later. I found a couple things off about the friend and what he stated. According to the mutual friend, three days before their death, Lala shared this information with him. We also heard earlier in the story the family hadn't heard or spoken to the couple in about four days three to four days after they were dropped off at the studio. 
October 15th. We also learn from the news clip, investigators and or the autopsy report. The cops reported the couple was dead at least three days before they were discovered. So one question I always had in mind was if the couple last visited the friend six days before their death on October the 13th, how could Lala have told him anything three days before her death, which they were discovered on Friday, October the 19th? Does that make sense to y'all? Or is he going by the assumed date, which the cops said that they had at least been dead at least three days before? So I, that part to me just sounded off. I don't know. It just it just rubbed me the wrong way. Because it sound. I mean, if we're going by Friday, October the 19th, um, it was said that he seen them last the Saturday before. So that's like six days before. But they had supposedly died three days before already. They had at least been dead three days, they said. So he says three days before the three days before their death. So if it's three days before their death, if you say Friday the 19th was the date they were discovered. If you go back three days, that would have been the 19th. That would have been the 16th. And that Saturday was the 13th. So, so is he going by that Saturday, three days before their death? The date that they're saying like, he, he must be going by the date that the cops are saying that they were at least dead by. But their their date on their on their on their uh on their grave site in the cemetery and all that said uh October the nineteenth. That was the date they were discovered. But if they would have been dead three days before that, that would have put them at the sixteenth. And the friends said he's seen him on the 13th. So I I don't know. I don't know. It's either that or he's saying three days before the date that they're saying, which they was discovered on the 19th. So if it was three days before that date, that would have been the 16th, and that would further put him in a in a in a in a bad place because that would have meant that either he was the last person to see them and talk to them or whatever, or he's going by that Saturday date and the date that the cops said that they were at least dead by. So I don't know. Y'all give me an answer on that. I don't know, but it just rubbed me the wrong way. Anyway. But wait, but wait a minute, uh-uh, come back here, come, 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 come back here, because wait a minute, if, now mistaken me, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but in my mind, when he says three days before their death, I, I'm assuming, I'm, I, everybody's, I mean, I don't know. Even the family uh, refers to October the 19th as the date they died. So, if you said three days before their death, that would have been a 16th. And if we're going by with the news clippings and the cops were saying, they said, they had said that, um, that the couple was at least dead three days before they were discovered. So if we talking about three days, then we talking about October the 16th. And then we further talking about, you seen them three days before their death, or you talked to them three days before their death, that would have meant the 16th. Why wouldn't he just say 
I, she told me this six days before my death instead of three days. I mean, if you if you say you seen them October the 13th, if we're talking about the discovery date, the discovery date was October the 19th. So that's six days apart. Why wouldn't he just say, why wouldn't he just say she told him that six days before her death instead of three? I, I, I'm sorry, y'all. It, it's just, it, it, that part just keep, uh-uh. Uh uh, come back here, boy. <laughs> that part right there just it's not it's not sitting with me right. Mm mm. Something ain't right. Something is not clean in the buttermilk. Okay. Y'all tell me. I don't know. I could be wrong, but I'm just saying. Shit. So I don't know, y'all. Tell me what y'all think. Uh, tell me what what do y'all think about the statement the friend made. And what are your thoughts about the case? Let me know in the comment box below. 2011, Lala Brown, remember by a YouTube channel by the name of Eric Carter. Last video with Big City. This is just a memorial clip of one of Lala Brown's last moments and memories in a studio shared on Eric Carter's YouTube channel. I'll link the full video down in the description box as well as for anyone who wants to watch the full video on his page. What's your name, little mama? Uh, I've been looking a while, but I can't seem to find someone like me. Cause either I was playing, or either they were faking, or I felt they weren't the one for me. I've been looking a while, but I can't seem to find someone like Lala. Because either they were playing, or either I was faking, or I felt they. Now is the time for you to decide if I'm exactly what you like. Cause I'm buzzing game hard, for sure you're the type. I don't know the rules to get paid, but once we got close, now I changed my mind. I'm not gonna Then came TV1's Celebrity Crime Files on October 2012. They also featured the two on their show. Season 1, Episode 2, in the same month on October 10th, 2021, TMG4 News ran a special on Crack That Case, broadcasted Lala's sister, Alicia Brown, doing a walkthrough of the crime scene. She agreed to go back to the studio after years of not ever thinking she'd revisit the place. She took the news crew through a walk of the building and gave a statement. She was very emotional about being back at the murder scene. Despite all the press the families had continued to do, asking for help, there was still no closure. And still, the case went unsolved growing colder and colder by the minute, day, month, and years. 2012 to 2016, update, summer 2016. Time went on, and then summer of 2016, almost a decade later and four years after the last media broadcast, police informed Lala Brown's father they had two suspects of interest in custody. However, the subjects were already in custody in another state, serving time on charges in Arizona, unrelated to the 2007 murder case. Though they had made a connection from the murder to the suspects and were sure they had the correct suspects, 
they did not jump at the chance to prosecute. They informed Lala's parents they were for sure correct and would eventually have the suspects extradited back to Milwaukee to stay in trial on the charges. They were just not in a rush. They knew the suspects were already in custody and wouldn't be going anywhere anytime soon, so they didn't feel the need to push the issue. But they ensured Mr. Brown that once they were through with serving their time in Arizona, they would then push this case through. However, years still passed on without any more information, update, or a trial to move forward. 2017, Dina Chambers still fights for justice. 2017, a decade later, and still no conviction or trial, the families keep their loved ones' names and legacy alive by continuing their annual balloon release and visual for the couple. Kool-Aid's mother, Dina Chambers, organizes a memorial gathering for the couple's annual balloon release in memory of the two. She continues to get their story out through the news networks and other public media platforms in hopes that someone will come forth offering up any information they have. 2019. State awards the couple 2019 Assembly Joint Resolution 58 relating to June 2019 Black Music Month. The families continue to spread their story and reach out to the public media and news seeking for new information or updates. They continue asking for help to solve the murders as well as get together for memorial gatherings. During 2019's Memorial Gathering, they celebrated Lala and Kool-Aid's accomplishments. The couple was awarded by the state during June's Black Music Month. They were added to the 2019 Assembly Joint Resolution 58 relating to recognizing June 2019 as Black Music Month in the state of Wisconsin. Tony Mama, yeah! About December 21st, 2021. Life Jennings opens up about Protégé's death. Life Jennings does an interview with comedian Pierre on his YouTube podcast show called Pierre's Panic Room. Jennings opens up a little through the interview, bringing up Lala Brown. He talked about how the two met and why he didn't really talk about it much in the years after Lala's passing. He also talks about when he reached out to Lala's daughter, Amira. He said Lala had a lot of royalty she never had a chance to receive due to her death and that he had a ton of unreleased music of Lala's that she had created while under his label. He gave all the music to Amira, Lala's daughter, to recoup all of her mother's royalties that she never received. He also put her in touch with the right people to help her do that. And she was also able to create a documentary on her mother's life through the process. I don't believe it is officially out yet, but it is reported that she is currently working on it. You can catch the full Life Jennings interview through Comedian Pierre's YouTube channel, Pierre's Panic Room, which will be linked below in the description box as well. June 8th, 2021. Speaking of Lala Brown's daughter, upon looking for updated information on her mother's case, I found her YouTube channel and Instagram account. The once five-year-old baby girl is now in her 20s and all grown up. I always wondered about her after hearing about her mom's case years ago. She is now on the scene with her own channel and following in her mother's footsteps. She is now working on her own music career, modeling, acting, creating her mother's documentary and more. She strongly resembles her mom. She is just as beautiful as her mom was. She's her mom's twin. Her voice even reminds me of her mom's when she speaks. Amira Brown features vlogging videos, memorial videos of her mom and pics along with more on her channel. She has 86 different videos on her channel and 7.7 .7 subscribers. She also has an interview she previously did 
with another YouTube channel called Viral Wave TV. <laughs> Hey y'all, it's your girl Lil Lala. We doing an interview with Viral TV. Subscribe and like. When asked about what she remembers from the time her mom was still living and what she remembers of the last time she saw her mom, she expressed how she felt losing her mom so young and really wanting to go with her the night of her death. When she talked about what she remembered from her mom and her mother's time together, it really saddened me. My sisters and mother both lost their mothers around the same age. And I know how hard they all still take it to this day, especially around certain dates of the year. So I can understand the void of missing a loved one who is so close that no longer is here, but I can never imagine the pain. That's a rough situation. And especially when you have no closure here, we're in 2022, and their family still has no closure or justice. And again, Lala's father passed on, and so has Kule's aunt, both without seeing any justice for their loved ones. It's just a sad case, but I pray the rest of the family does receive answers and justice very soon so they can close this chapter and move on. <laughs> projects, memories she shares in the keep up with the documentary of her mom. You could visit Amira's YouTube channel at Lil Lala and follow her IG at Lil underscore Lala one. I'll link her information down in the description box below as well. Go show your support, subscribe, like, and share and tell her I sent you. So the latest I came across this year on this case was an update from Kool-Aid's mother and brother on live court tv the unsolved case file they are offering a reward for any help and information that helps solve the case we're asking you for your help if you have any information we're going to keep those those phone numbers up uh, throughout the segment tonight we also posted it on social media uh, so if you have information please come forward this one goes back 14 years a couple of really talented young people um, an incredible loss uh, for the families and, and, and for the world, for the music that they were making and the music they were going to make. Talk about Lala Brown and Jatan Claiborne. Pray and hope tonight that someone, someone will take the time and pick up the phone and give our family justice. The Brown family and the Claiborne family. Yolanda Lala Brown and Jatan Claiborne loved each other and they loved music. At age of 22, Jatan Kool-Aid Claiborne opened Loud Enough Music Studios in Milwaukee, both shot to death inside the studio. He had so much to offer the world and his life was sniffed out by someone that just didn't care for human life. Information for the full interview and channel will be also linked in the description box below. So a couple quick questions and things I've noticed or always wondered about this case. For one, who was the caller on America's Most Wanted who called into the radio station? I got a question. Um, as far as um, Lala and um, Kool-Aid, um, do y'all have any like, possible leads or you know, any motive as to why such a tragic thing would happen? She felt threatened for her life. 
But she said that three days before she died. I'm not trying to cast any shade over anybody, but that caller's voice was kind of distinctive and it kind of resembled the uh, the stylist or the, the barber friend, in my opinion. But again, I could be wrong and it could just be just a random caller. But um, I don't know. Y'all answer that in the, the description box below. And so, again, does the hairstylist or the barber know more than he's telling? What's the timeline? And what was up with the three days he said Lala shared the information with him? Did he mean three days before they were discovered or the date the couple were assumed to have died on? The three days earlier than their discovery date. What did he mean? And then another thing. Who did Lala have charges pressed against? Or who did she get a restraining order put out on? Because if I'm not mistaken, you would have to have the name of the person you want the report made about. Or for a restraining order to be placed. And for the order to be effective. So it has to be some kind of paper trail or known issue between uh between the individuals before they even file a restraining order i don't know how milwaukee's laws are but i know in pennsylvania where i'm from you have to have a name to place uh a restraining order or make a report and they're like te they're temporary before a case goes to trial so i'm wondering if that person is or was a suspect in this case or if they were in any way connected to this case i don't know but if you're from milwaukee you can let me know how that works uh if you know their laws or about their restraining orders put it in the description box i mean put it in the put it in the comments below and then who was the guy corn that life jennings mentioned lala was dealing with or dating at the time that he met her in atlanta she was working in a club um during that time that they met and he met her through corn, somebody, some guy named corn. So who was he? Um, life mentioned him during his interview on Pierre's panic room. He mentioned on the interview that he met her through him before she was kicked off the tour. Did somebody from the club she was working at maybe follow her back to Milwaukee? Did she have some kind of ties from there that maybe ended prematurely without any closure? Did Kool-Aid have some past ties that ended prematurely that may have led to some jealousy or a scorned ex who was mad that he had moved on and started dating Lala? I mean, it was reported that he had a baby on the way during the time of his passing, which meant another female was pregnant while him and Lala were together so maybe a past lover who was upset and then another thing i wondered about why was lala and life jennings having so many disagreements and arguments for months prior to him abruptly kicking her off the remainder of the tour and sending her back with nothing no money no recording label deal anymore release from her contract no royalties for her feature or unreleased music like, why? Why was that? The song about her life, give them what they want. Was she addressing life through her lyrics? Or was this song at all about them? Or was this just a song that she just made? Price, I would pay, sacrifice my baby, send her away. It happened so fast, it felt like a day. A snap of a finger and la la was made. Started with lights, now it's just dark. Room from the torn apart, feelings and hearts. I work too damn hard to be unappreciated. I made some mistakes in my career and I hate it. But whoever thought would make me a star? It was said to have been about her life, so I'm assuming it must have been a situation um, that happened that she recorded about. So I don't, I don't know, but I'm just wondering uh, the timeline of when she made that song because the lyrics kind of 
I don't know. And lastly, who were the culprits who broke into the studio and stole $10,000 worth of equipment? Was this somebody they owed? Was this a struggling artist trying to steal equipment for their own come up? Or just some random bums who didn't want to work for their own shit and wanted to come up on a lick? Who were they? And did they have something to do with this? I don't know. But I just have so many questions and thoughts about this. Just my personal observations. But I could be wrong. Either way, somebody knows something. But you can tell me your thoughts on this case or what you noticed about the case. Let me know down in the comments below so we can discuss. Now, before I close out and get up out of here, I just want to give a shout out. To all the other channels pushing real content and bringing awareness to the community there's a few good channels out here who speak on several real life meaningful topics as well as the ones who speak on these topics who've been keeping the victims cold cases unsolved cases and missing people's stories alive amongst others without any of these stories being told or brought to light people may not even be aware of the stories or of them or even though their cases still hasn't been solved yet many of the victims out there haven't received much press in the news if any and it's so important their stories be told in hopes to return the missing and maybe accelerate the progress of the cases if the community is unaware of their stories how else can answers be found in these unsolved cases if they haven't even been heard of or light hasn't been brought or shed to their cases. I'm a mother myself and all these cases keep me on my toes. It keeps us mothers aware for our own babies. And you never know who you can reach with your content or who you may help. The more people speak up or continue shedding light on these topics, maybe eventually someone will feel that remorse and step up with information to finally close these cases. So to use, I salute. I'm in a real shit, real content, and real information that keep the community aware. So it's a few channels I really fuck with on that content. So I especially want to shout out all you kings for doing your thing. Shout out to my day one, my number one, Brazy. On his channel, Brazy World. We've been rocking heavy since day one. You never switched up. Been thorough from the start. You've been doing your thing on your channel since you've been putting out your content. And you bring the realness every time you drop something. You genuinely keep it 100. And you bring real insight on these different topics. And so you already know what time it is. I salute you, King. Shout out to Just Say No to Sco, J Marvelous, and Night and Day Network, LLC. Curry gang, what up? The videos and content you all put out be the realest. It's never about pushing a certain narrative, but to push truth. And all of you kings, keep the youth woke. It's a lot of influencers, media personalities, and YouTubers who just push a certain narrative or who serve only one purpose, to keep the sleep asleep. But when y'all come, like I said, Y'all come with that real, thorough content every time. We need more real-ass people to step up and bring that real, raw content and to keep it a buck. Because at the end of the day, let's be real. We in a different time now, a different generation. And to most of us who have kids, no stuff is different for them growing up as it was for us growing up in our generation. Most of our kids in this generation now have phones, tablets, laptops, or whatever it is they need that's technology-based or whatever it is they need where they can have access to damn near anything. They're growing up in a different generation based on technology. And so with that being said, the best thing we could do is put out some content of substance that can help steer them in a better direction or to help anyone who may need it 
just by sharing our knowledge on different content, speaking truth, bringing awareness to different things of importance in our communities, or just sharing our experiences with any of them who reach our content and channels. Every one of you kings deliver every time. And so for that, I just want to say I salute you all. Keep doing your thing because we need all of it. Lastly, I just want to send my prayers and condolences out to anyone at this time suffering the loss of a loved one. My heart truly goes out to all of you. I made this platform specifically to inform people in our communities about everyday real life things that's happening in our communities. To speak on real topics or whatever it is that's important to speak about. Just to open a space for people to be able to share their stories in order to spread awareness and to converse about real situations happening around us in our own communities. So feel free to hit me up about any topic or to send requests about certain stories, topics, or if you want to tell your own story or a loved one's story. If anyone wants to reach out to me to share your story or a loved one's story, you can send me your request at Holy Grail Beauty Supply at gmail.com. I'm going to link my email below for y'all. Thank you for watching my video. If you like this video, hit the like button, share, or leave a comment below. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button to be notified when I post more content on the channel. And if you like real content on real topics, not that watered down shit, go check out those channels I specifically mentioned. You'll fuck with those channels because they specifically do that kind of content. Let them know I sent you. All their links, along with the other channels whose content I used in this video, will be linked in the description box below for anyone who wants to check them out. Check out my trailer for the next episode.